um, some other information that might be of interest to you within the next couple of weeks. All of you have been muted. Um, and as we get to the end of our program this evening, there will be a chance for some sharing. So you can unmute yourself at that point, but please until then leave your microphones muted so that we can all hear as easily as possible. So we thought it would be well for us to gather one more time to remember our sisters and their important example to us in these turbulent times of ours. To thank all of you who helped to make the 40th anniversary of the martyrdom of our sisters, Ida, Mara, Dorothy, and Jean, so very special. To celebrate the more than 40 commemorations of the 40th anniversary that took place across the United States and around the world. We recorded 42 US-based events from coast to coast, north to south, and throughout the heartland of our country. And we heard about uh, many celebrations abroad, including events in London, Rome, Dernbach, San Pedro Sula, and of course, there was much singing and much praying and much remembering in El Salvador. So today we're gonna to lift up bits and pieces from some of those commemorations to give us a flavor of our global community and to once again, recommit ourselves to the cause of our sisters who gave their lives to build God's beloved community. I don't know. Yes, at that point. But is she a, I know, but is she a mere a sister? No, she was. So if you could, each of you make sure that your microphone phones are on mute, or you will be sharing things that you don't necessarily want to share with 108 other folks across the nation and around the world. So now let me turn this over to my good friend and our co-host, Jose Artiga who will say a few words of welcome and share an announcement about plans for next year's commemoration. Jose? Buenas tardes. My name is Jose Artiga and I am the executive director of the Share Foundation. We at the Share Foundation, guided by Eileen Purcell, Jean Stockton, and many others have been celebrating the lives of our sisters for 40 years. They are our source of strength and inspiration. We had to postpone the delegation to El Salvador and Honduras due to COVID from 2020 to December of 2021. Please mark your calendar for this coming December to join the delegation. We will have a delegation traveling to work with our Mercy and Notre Dame sisters in Honduras uh, to rebuild from the hurricanes. For those that cannot travel, we will have a virtual delegation and you can actively participate in the delegation from your home. January 16th today is the 29th anniversary of the signing of the peace accords in El Salvador that ended the 12 year of civil war. This weekend, we celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King and all the civil rights activists that gave their lives for the beloved community. Today, a caravan of 6,000 refugees from Honduras are walking to the US as we speak. Today is a wonderful day to remember our martyr sisters. Next, we would like to have Lynn Kirkonel, who will lead us on prayer. Well, as Jose said, my name is Lynn Kirkconnell, and I'm really, really delighted um, to be here um, 
this afternoon out in California. I am the co-promoter of Justice and Peace for the Dominican Sisters of San Rafael and the Dominican Sisters of Mission San Jose. So let us just take a moment and breathe in the spirit of love as we begin our celebration with a prayer of remembrance and thanksgiving. We gather in a spirit of peace to share some of the many celebrations honoring our sisters, Dorothy, Jean, Ita, and Mora. They lost their lives because of their commitment to the impoverished of El Salvador, who were living under a military dictatorship characterized by greed and indescribable brutality. They are the named among the 70,000 unnamed victims of that Salvadoran civil war. These women continue to be living examples of trust, compassion, and selfless love because of their tireless work for those struggling for justice. Their lives and their deaths inspire us to renew our own commitments to help birth a world committed to equity, harmony, truth, and justice for all. We recall the spirit of each of these women martyrs and after each remembrance, we will respond, may your spirit live in me. Jean Donovan, a few months before her death, Jean wrote, I don't know how the poor survive. People in our positions really have to die to ourselves and our wealth to gain the spirituality of the poor and oppressed. Jean worked to bring justice and joy to the lives of the people of La Libertad, especially the children. The people dubbed her Saint Jean, the playful. Source of all life, help us learn a spirituality of the poor so that we can touch others with a joy-filled spirit like Jean, bringing delight and laughter to those around us. Jean, may your spirit live in me. Jean. May your spirit live in me. Sister Dorothy Kazel. Dorothy was supposed to return to the United States in June of 1980. She asked permission from her community to extend her stay, saying, it would definitely want to stay here with the people and help them in whatever way. When the chips are completely down, you can't just walk out on people you've been working with. Divine Presence, help us to have the dedication of Dorothy and never say no to working in community with others that those in need may have their needs met. And so we pray. Dorothy, Dorothy, may your may spirit, your spirit live, in live in me. Sister Mara Clark, even though Mara knew the dangers that lay ahead, she left her decades long ministry in Nicaragua, joining Ita in El Salvador. Following a few weeks of discernment in El Salvador, she wrote, one cries out, Lord, how long? And then two, what creeps into my mind is the little fear, or big, that when it touches me very personally, will I be faithful? I want to stay on now. I believe now that this is right. 
compassionate one, let us have the faith and trust of Mara, who prayed for strength to face the challenges she knew lay ahead. Mara, may your spirit live in me. Dr. Ita Ford. In 1980, Ita and her friend Carla Paik left their ministry in Chile to begin their mission in Chalatenango, working with the poor and with war victims. They provided food, shelter, transportation, and even burial. This was the challenging work that gave meaning to Ita's life. The day before she was assassinated, she wrote home to her niece a message she sends to us today. I hope that you come to find that which gives life a deep meaning for you, something worth living for, maybe even worth dying for, something that energizes you, enthuses you, enables you to keep moving ahead. transforming creator, let us have the zeal and commitment of Ita and help us to recognize that which gives deep meaning to our lives. And let us pray. Ita, may your may spirit, spirit live in me. Spirit of love, during this year, this 40th anniversary year of Ita Mora Dorothy and Jean's martyrdom. We are aware of how their courage has inspired all of us. Although they began their lives in the United States and ministered in El Salvador, their courage has caused them to be claimed by the whole world. We give deep thanks for their life examples that compel us to recommit ourselves to the world they envisioned, a world without war, violence, hunger, poverty, and corruption. They and many others have given their lives in pursuit of a just world, and we commit ourselves to continue their legacy so that all may have life and have it in abundance. Amen. Ita, Maura, Dorothy, and Jean, our sisters, are present today. But how do we bring our sisters to the present moment? How do we follow their example? How do we remember them? They were simple taking up the task of the moment, taking care of children in the time of deadly war. What does it mean to take care of children? Embracing them as they cry their lost parents, feeding them, clothing them, talking to them, changing their diapers, curing their wounds, and giving them a treat. You can see an image of the ocean in a very drop of water. One action of love and justice has the whole ocean of justice in it. At the same time, our sisters told the people's story of injustice to elected officials in positions of power, like Sister Ita wrote her congressman and shared the horrific impact of US military aid to the poor. That said, the last thing the sisters expected was to change the world, but they were changing the world by doing very simple tasks with love and compassion. As you feel and close and embrace a child you learn the name of that child. That child has a name, Jesus, Mary. That child has a face 
and that child has dreams. One story that I admire is when Marinol's sister Carla was driving a young man who had been accused of being a guerrilla back to safety. The young man, Jesus, had been released from detention and needed to be taken back to his family to the mountains of Chalatenango. It had been raining in the small creek at San Antonio de los Ranchos became a violent river. The current took the vehicle and Carla struggled to push the young man out of the car. The young man survived. By saving his life, Sister Carla drowned. The people of Chalatenango remember the story of Sister Carla and they tell the story to their children. This year, those very children brought flowers to the tomb of Ita, Maura, and Carla at the cemetery in Chalatenango. We remember our sisters by doing what needs to be done. Once a person asked Monsignor Romero, how do I know I'm doing the right thing? Without hesitation, Romero responded, you feel a bit uncomfortable. Well, our sisters not only felt uncomfortable, they were afraid of what might happen to them and their community. We are afraid of change. I am afraid of the technology and how it's changing people's behavior. I'm afraid of the fact that 70 million people supported Trump and many believe his theories of conspiracy. I am afraid of how divided the country is. I'm fearful of those who do not recognize the humanity of those who disagree with them, who are African-Americans or immigrants. I'm especially afraid of the ones that believe in violence and have guns. I'm afraid when I see a flyer inviting people to a demonstration at our state capitol, which says, bring arms. Then I reflect on the lives, an example of Ita, Maura, Dorothy, and Jean. I turn the TV off and start doing simple tasks to support the families affected by the hurricanes in Honduras. I picture Sister Rosa Maria, a school sister of Notre Dame in Honduras, stands four, four feet tall and her courage as she takes a boat full of drinking water to communities isolated by the hurricanes. We learn from our sisters that it's okay to be afraid, especially in front of difficult or impossible situations. We pray, get closer to the people of God and keep walking with them. They give us permission to rest, to replenish, to reflect, to do the small and large tasks. They invite us to find joy in the work, to sing, to dance, to share poetry, to recognize the great blessing it is walk with the people of God. Each of you on this call continues to live our sister's legacy. Each of you and your communities has given a historical contribution to the struggle of peace, for justice, for human rights, for the beloved community. You inspire me. You are a great bright light. You keep their memory alive. Ita, Maura, Dorothy, Jean, and all the martyrs and say with me, presente, presente, presente. Presente.
Gracias, Jose, for your words of inspiration, for your words of challenge, and for your words of encouragement. I know many of you, like me, had planned to celebrate the 40th anniversary in El Salvador and Honduras. And that was not to be. We had hoped to walk the way of our sisters, to pray with the people of El Salvador at their grave sites, to travel on to Honduras, to see and to learn, to listen and to walk in solidarity with the people in need. That was not to be. The pandemic made that impossible. And yet I think it was a blessing. Because we could not go to learn and to see and to grow, we turned our energy towards sharing, towards sharing the stories of these women of faith and courage, toward inviting others who had never heard the story, who didn't know our sisters into that reality and to challenge it, uh, them to join us as we walk in solidarity with the people of Central America. And so we turned our energy toward creating celebrations, commemorations here. You all made those celebrations happen. You all invited new folks into the circle. You all spread the word, what it takes, what it costs, and what joy there is in building God's beloved community. So tonight, we've invited three speakers to reflect on the events that they hosted. And just to share a few highlights or a story from that particular event, to reflect on what it meant to each of them to remember and why it is so critically important to keep the memory alive. So let me introduce you to the first of our speakers. Peg Dillon entered Marinal in 1963. And as Peg describes it, the peoples and the bioregions in Nicaragua, the Philippines, Panama, and at Marinal, New York, have formed her. Currently, Peg is working in the Marinal Sisters Mission Institute, which provides continuing education and renewal programs for missioners and others who engage in cross-cultural ministries throughout the world. Peg, thank you so much for joining us. You are most welcome. Well, let me tell you, you all, as a Mary Noel sister, I am so grateful for stepping again into this energy field of Maura, Ita, Jean, and Dorothy, and now with all of you. We honor them. We honor these women because we knew them, we love them. And since that Tuesday of December 2nd, 1980, Mary Nollers, the family, friends, churches and organizations and religious communities have come together. Since that day, we needed to be together physically because it was too stark, too indescribable. And we have done this now for 40 years. We have come together. And we honor Jean and Maura and Dorothy and Ida because they are women of the gospel and their passion and humor and unconditionally loving continues to move us all. And we do this in Advent, every Advent we recall God's self gift to us in Jesus. And so we come face to face with our own choice of self gift 
just as they did. And each Advent, each Advent, we understand a bit more that service, that mission, is not a short-term comfortable commitment, but hasta final, until the end. It's a daily intention of going the whole way for God, wherever we are and at whatever age in life. Their story is significant today because what they gave their lives for, as we have heard in the prayers, what they gave their lives for is unfinished. To feed the hungry, to reduce poverty, ignorance, oppression, to care for the children, to protect earth and all those so vulnerable. So much is unfinished in El Salvador. So much is unfinished everywhere and also here in the United States. These four women, so very different, are our models of passion, joy, prayer, laughter, and hope. But also they are models that make us curious. Why do they do that? Who are they? How can we tell their story without giving answers, but by making people curious? In the ritual of remembrance that we created at Mary Knoll, our focus was on energy, their energy as generative for a kind, juster, just, and more beautiful world. And our hope was to focus not necessarily on the elders many of us have become, but on the next generation, the youth, as students, as nieces and nephews and grandnieces and grandnephews. How could this 40th anniversary speak to them? How could they become aware of and deepen their own search for meaning, for meaning. Our ritual focused on the word of God as expressed by blood family members as community members and those who are impacted by their lives. And all of the celebration, all of the 40 celebrations were always toward a recommitment to hearing the cries of earth and the cries of the poor. For me personally, it was another moment of integrating their friendship and presence in my life. This time was a bit different though. I sensed that earth and the arts would be the way toward reimagining and recommitting myself above the horror and finding new meaning in that moment. Our ritual used an image, the seed, the seed that fell from those trees that surrounded their shallow grave. We are called by the life force of that seed. We are called to respond, each in our daily life. Now, Marino sister Yusu Kim will interpret this with her meditative dance. We have used the art of movement and you are invited now to enter into a moment, into a prayer movement.
Thank you. Peg, thank you. Thank you so much for reminding us that the seed has been planted in each of us. And it's, it's for us to plant that seed in our world. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. So our second speaker is Sheila Marie Toby, an Ursuline sister from Cleveland. Sheila Marie has been engaged in ministries related to peace and justice, nonviolent training and Catholic social justice teaching for most of her life. She's worked in parish ministry, training parish leaders in multicultural settings, including in El Salvador and has accompanied countless groups of adults and young people on mission trips to El Salvador. Currently, Sheila Marie serves on the board of CARA Peace Mission that cares for vulnerable children and families in El Salvador. Sheila Marie, we're so glad you were able to join us today. Thank you so much. You are most welcome. Sheila Marie, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. It's a, it's a tough yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, I was just telling Jose, I was in El Salvador for the signing of the peace accords. Uh, I remember the day very well. <laughs> it was quite an exciting day in El Salvador. Uh, so when they asked me to, to work with the 40th anniversary this year, my congregation, we were kind of stuck. <laughs> we were in a very difficult place. I had worked with the 35th in Cleveland. Uh, and at that point, it was a four month event. We started in September and we did something every single month with the three Catholic colleges, the 31 parishes that visit El Salvador with our diocesan mission team and our 15 high schools to translate letters for the um, for the children's village there. So it was a major thing that went on for, as I say, four months and um, culminated on December 2nd. So this year uh, in March, we finished our elections of our new council and got into lockdown. And so they asked me, do what you can with the 40th anniversary, we have no idea in the meantime we moved out of the mother house that we had always celebrated the anniversary in, the, the one where Dorothy did her novitiate, and uh, we're in the process of demolishing it. It's still a pile of rubble next to me here. So uh, the council was very, uh, and the offices had moved, the archives had moved, the archives were still in boxes in the new offices, which are not on the site of the residence where we're living, where quite a few of us are living right now. So there we were trying to figure out how are we gonna do the 40th anniversary and in the style that we've done the five year anniversaries, especially in the past where we always do a big Alleluia award and everything. And then Jean contacted me and it was like the grace of God. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Here's something we can work with uh, and so I went to Mary Moran, who is our now our communications person, and she's working virtually from home, but very competent. She went to El Salvador in 1989 to do the video for the diocese. She was newly uh, out of college, newly married, and was sent to do the video for the 25th anniversary of the mission team in El Salvador. So she knew Dorothy's story inside and out, and then about 10 years ago, she started working with us. So she's always been a part of this, but this time it was a big challenge for her. We were starting from scratch, putting together that wonderful web page that she did. And when she got back from El Salvador from 1989, she found out she was pregnant. So she always says that the women sent her the child and now she had the way to pay back for the children and uh, her uh, really transformative experience. She was going to try to be here with me tonight, but she couldn't because she had an engagement with her family. <laughs> so, um, so we got the website together. We were able to find enough things online that we had from various times that we've done 
anniversaries in the past. And then we started working with our sponsored ministries. The college had already planned something. The college is 150 years old and they had planned something for their alumni online with Eileen Markey. Uh, it's what they call their voices event. The two high schools were working on it. One of them was gonna do a play. Uh, the college, a couple of years ago, the drama department actually wrote a play using only Dorothy's words. It's almost 100% Dorothy's words. So the high school was going to put it on this year as part of the celebration. And they were able to readjust it and they got it on. They have five students reading different parts, but they're actually going to do it sometime in the spring. Uh, they're back to in-face uh, classes again. But all everything went to virtual in all of our sponsored institutions, all four, in November because of the pandemic. So everything they planned had to be replanned and rethought. So, uh, but the, uh, all four of them did something major, which they then put on their website that went to all the alumni that the high school is 175 years old and the other high school is 150 years old. The elementary school is one we've had since 1968 in the inner city with predominantly Hispanic children from many of them from Central America. So they were able to share it with their families in their virtual education setting. So it, it went a very different direction, but we know it was a direction that was definitely guided by the Holy Spirit and is still, we're still working with collecting all the things. We're interested in collecting everything that's been done because there is quite a bit of conversation now about the possibilities of canonization. The Bretts have written their new book that Orbis published, uh, Martyrs of Hope. And they're very strongly encouraging us, as is Notre Dame University. Uh, we've done some work with them, their Romero Center, and the Romero Center in London. That was the connection to London. And they're very strongly encouraging the canonization process. So we have our second new bishop in Cleveland uh, just a matter of months ago. So we haven't even approached it with him, but we have had the Cardinal, Rosa Chavez was here uh, a couple of years ago to celebrate one of the anniversaries of the children's village. And he was very strongly encouraging. And at that point we had Bishop Perez who was also very strongly encouraging it. So uh, who's moved on to Philadelphia and uh, has, is in charge of the USCCB Office of Diversity. So we think that uh, he will pursue it also. So it went a different direction, has a much larger audience than we've always had a large Cleveland audience, but uh, we never expanded too much beyond Cleveland. This is our first adventure for being as international as the Mary Knowles have always been. Well, Sheila Marie, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I think you brought broke some news here tonight, perhaps. Yeah, news well, we don't know. It's just a beginning conversation, but all of this, uh, you know, coverage and all, especially since it's digital, so it's easy to store. We'll be able to, we can finally unpack our archives and uh, begin to, to explore the possibilities of, of that. And we'll see where it goes. I, I know there's been some conversation with the Mary Knoll sisters also. So um, we'll see, but there is quite a bit of international interest in it. And Rosa Chavez was, he kept the whole time he was here and I was escorting him and translating for him. And he kept saying all the different groups he was with, you have to do this, you have to do this. Well, that's, so that's on December 2nd, I started at 845 in the morning and went till 1145 at night. I attended about 18 events. <laughs> so I'm very eager to hear everybody's experience doing their events because they were wonderful. I was very uh, touched by them. Well, thank you, and 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 thank you particularly for the your efforts to introduce the story 
or retell the story to young people. That is so critically important. And, and the um, play is available. That's great to know. So if high schools want to do it, uh, the college did it as a one person and, and she was quite gifted, but uh, we've rewritten it now so it can be done with three or four young women, each taking a part of Dorothy's life. And it's pretty much all her words. Thank you. We'll just have to work at making sure that all of these resources that so many groups have, have collected and created are available. I think, I think we can do that. So thank you again. Thank you. Our thank final you for all you've done because this will help. <laughs> Our final speaker is Maria Elena Perales. Maria Elena directs the uh, Justice Office for the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, where she's been ministering for 15 years. Maria Elena and her family immigrated from Mexico in 1976. And as an immigrant, she can relate to the obstacles that are faced by our brothers and sisters who are forced from their homes and, and made to, lo to walk those long miles in search of safety for their families. She is the mother of two adult children who also work in the nonprofit field promoting social justice, Gr proof of her motherhood. Maria Elena, we thank you for joining us this evening and, and for your work in the field of, of social justice and, and for your vocation to as a mother, raising two wonderful children. So thanks for joining us this evening. Tell us a little bit about what happened with the Sisters of St. Joseph in Orange. Thank you, Anne. Um, thank you for the invitation to share amongst all here who are present to specially celebrate the lives of our North American women, our sisters martyred in El Salvador. Um, yes, let me share what we did. Um, so there was a packet that was sent out early, I remember, uh, with all types of information, a toolkit. What we did is we adapted that for our sisters um, we, um, you know, provide an opportunity for awareness, action, uh, reflection, and we send it out in mid-November. And we ask them to choose a time when they like to pray. Uh, given everyone's so busy and lives are just so busy nowadays, we thought this would fit better for all of them. But we also did, you know, we saw so many uh, opportunities for prayer. They were uh, um, coming in. So we compile a list of all these events and we send that to them and had them choose what they wanted also to attend. And that was, um, there was there were all these various opportunities that they appreciated um, so they could share with their own individual communities. And, and so that was done. Um, so um, various ways that we all prayed and shared. But I have to say, and I like to share that for the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, El Salvador has a special place in our hearts. One of our sisters, Sister Elena Jaramillo, ministered there in our, with our Salvadorian brothers and sisters in Tierra Blanca, Iquilisco, from 1981 until about two years ago. Mm -hmm. So in preparing to share today, I decided to have a conversation with Sister Elena about her experience there. Um, so um, um, she was very candid and spoke from her heart. And it was hard to figure out how do I share her love for people, our brothers and sisters. She shared um, that while ministering there, she, she was living with the people, her people. She shared their burdens, their dreams, their pain. She, she very truly believes that it is in immersing oneself in their suffering, or as she put it, in their penas, that one can carry their load, their burden. So I'm thinking, Possibly the women martyrs found it hard to leave El Salvador 
when their lives were threatened because they were already deeply immersed in the suffering of their people. And so the need to help carry their load as well. One thing Sister Elena remembers clearly when she ministered there was when she was visited by delegations. She says that they would have liked, she would have liked to have said when she would be asked, what do you want me to do? What should I do? Tell me. And she would think to herself, if people only knew that it is not about the doing that gives life, but rather is about being. One only needs to look around and just listen so that they, their load, so that they can unload their burden. She wanted to tell them, you are here and you are not going to get a job. You are not going to do a job. Rather, you are here to accompany the people. Sometimes we just need to hear the words of comfort to accompany them. So if one does get assigned something to do, she, would, she said, don't assume that you know the best way to do it. Let the people tell you what they need most. Let the people tell you how to do it. Sister Elena feels in her heart that the North American women knew they were in danger, but they refused to abandon the people because as she fell in love with the people, her brothers and sisters of El Salvador, so did the women. She very lovingly said, as she shared with me, Uno se encariña con el pueblo. One falls in love with the people. And so they become your family. And so they became my family. As she thinks back, she reflects that the North American women, our sisters, build community and the people there had a great deal of support and hope because of their presence. She finally said, and I'd like to end with this quote from her. The Salvadorian people make you a new person. All you need to do is listen, but listen with your ears of your heart. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, what a wise woman, what wise women. All we have to do is open our hearts, allow ourselves to fall in love again with the people with whom we walk. They'll show us the way, just as our four sisters did so many years ago and continue to this day, to offer us a way to fall in love again with God's people and to walk with them simply as sisters and brothers. Thank you, Maria Elena. Thank you so much. Yes. Jean, I think you're gonna to continue to take us down this road. Thank you. My name is Jean Stoken. And I serve on the justice team with the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas and I'm on the board of Share Foundation. I was gonna introduce my husband, Scott Wright, who some of you know, who spent eight years in El Salvador uh, during the war years. Um, 
but he left to get our daughter who's coming in on an airplane and it's on time so I couldn't but our daughter's named uh, Maura for Maura Clark so I just bring uh, that piece of the story into so again thank you for those stories thank you Cher and LCWR for this space uh, we next want to show you a video that captures some of the highlights of the 40th anniversary events around the country both in El Salvador and in the U.S. Uh, it was put together by our wonderful Racine Dominicans team, and I'll name them later. Uh, and just know it's just a, a, a smattering of pictures. Uh, we invited people to share their pictures from events, and many of the events were online. So uh, it, it was hard, but know you can continue to send uh, events, pictures, anything, resources to share. Cher is going to put a like a museum to the four church women and is building it for their website so it can be a store place. Um, uh, the song that we're going to use in the video is from Carolyn McDade. It's called Song of the Martyrs. And I just wanted to share, she wrote it for the five uh, women religious who were martyred in Liberia in 1992, Adorers of the Blood of Christ. Actually, my mother was an adorer of the Blood of Christ for seven years before she got married. But um, so we adapted that song. The words are in your Zoom link. You don't need to look at them. We'd rather you look at the video, but it's for later. Uh, the video also has two images from the two events in El Salvador. One is a walk to the cemetery in Chalatenango where the two Marinol sisters are buried, plus Sister Carla that Jose mentioned earlier died in the flash flood, but is very much remembered. For those of you who've been on those December 2nd delegations, we would walk in that procession to the cemetery with the townspeople and they all held up their pictures of their martyred family members either disappeared or killed in the war. Uh, a second scene that you'll notice in El Salvador is um, outside, it's, a site, it's actually at the site of where their bodies were found. Um, a church you'll see in the background, it was built on the site afterwards. And there's a monument um, in which people are gathering it around. And that monument, Cher really worked hard to advocate it with partners in El Salvador to gain recognition that that would be a permanent national monument site. And it did get that designation. So it will be there for posterity. So with that, we offer you the video.
¡Que vivan nuestras mártires! Thank you, um, particularly our Racine Dominicans. Uh, Shanae Farrell put that together, uh, but Sister Lisa Kane and Sister M. Pratt have been doing all of the background work for uh, the tech for this and have been on the planning committee. So thank you for the gift of that video. And come next year to be in those same spots for that delegation for the 41st anniversary. 
Um, this next section is supposed to be a call to action. And then we recognize that probably everybody on this call are the most active people out there in the world doing justice. So thank you for what you do each and every day. Uh, but given that the four churchwomen and Carla were called subversives because of their work on behalf of uh, displaced people internally, refugees, we wanted to name a few actions that are coming up in the next few weeks and months that, that we would invite you to make a commitment to as we go forward with the with the legacy. Uh, one is starting Wednesday, it's a new moment in terms of the Biden administration. Uh, our inside sources say that on day one, he wants to go bold on immigration, calling for the halt of the wall construction, rescinding the Muslim ban, pausing on deport deportations, uh, calling for a pathway to citizenship for undocumented peoples. Uh, and we would also hope a temporary protective status would be extended. The uh, Trump administration ended it. And just for example, two, almost a quarter million Salvadorans have protections in the US under, under TPS, which was ended. They also have 300,000 US born children. And we're gonna have to eventually face that decision of do you, go back and what do you do with your children? So we're hoping that too. So we'll see, some of these could happen as executive orders on day one. And then much of these things will need to move to Congress, but, but our part is to be prepared, do everything possible that you can to publicly affirm these bold moves. Use social media, letters to the editor, because there will be a backlash, loud, angry voices screaming at them. Uh, and blaming the victim, fanning fears, but the faith community can really play an invaluable role in un unmasking these, um, unmasking these uh, the racism underneath it. So again, be prepared, uh, be public with your comments uh, and let your Congress people know that you support these changes. Uh, second, uh, as you may have heard, we've been speaking a lot about Honduras uh, early on in the program, and Honduras has become the El Salvador um, of what it was. Uh, in Honduras, death squads and all religious workers, human rights uh, defenders being uh, targeted, receiving death threats. So the U.S. has been supporting a corrupt government in Honduras since the coup in 2009, and We've been trying to get US aid to Honduras, the military and the police cut. So the House of Representatives has had a bill called the Berta Casades, named after the slain and, uh, environmental indigenous woman, um, a bill to cut off uh, police and military aid. It's gonna happen again. Uh, it has to be reintroduced. So we don't have a number for it, but keep an eye out for it because it calls for the cutting off of police and military aid until there's a change in human rights and impunity is ended. We also have word that there will be a Senate piece. We've been working on this for a long time. It's still uh, confidential, but a Senate companion bill could come out in the next few weeks. Uh, get your senator to sign on it. Um, lastly, and third is more of a solidarity gestures. Um, both the pandemic uh, as well as two hurricanes have just caused massive destruction in Central America. Um, as Jose said yesterday, between five and 6,000 Hondurans crossed began a caravan. We prefer to call it an exodus, but have crossed and made it into Guatemala. Uh, another caravan is going to happen, uh, is supposedly planned for January 25th. Um, it's a sign of the desperation. I mean, these hurricanes, people destroyed everything. People lost everything. Uh, 70, 80 percent of the food production in Honduras in particular was lost in the flooding. Mud up to six inches deep, um, six feet deep, I'm sorry, in some houses. Poisonous water and then it, it's, it's, it becomes like cement. So people are uh, exhausted and uh, living with very little. Um, our sister Mercy Associate wrote a, a reflection just last week and sent it up to us on this post-pandemic, post, -pandemic, post uh, 
uh, hurricane moment. And her first sentence is, to live in, El in Honduras is to live in hell. Her last sentence is, but you can even live in hell, quote, you can even endure hell if you have love and solidarity. So Share Foundation and some of the others of us on the call here have been working hard to, to accompany them. Many of you might have helped with supporting financially. There's a project called Vamos a la Milpa. It translates, you know, roughly, let's go to to the plant, to the fields to plant, but it's much bigger. It's a project to try to build a bit of hope in the shell of the old, to help uh, encourage seeds for, the, for, for urban gardens, to help buy plots of land, but it has community organizing components that the people would be doing it collectively. And our partners in Honduras uh, are saying, you know, it, we need it to give people some hope that they can not only meet their food security needs, but also be able to show some hope at this moment because it really is desperation. So you can go to SHARE's website, S-H-A-R-E hyphen elsalvador.org and there's more on that, but we would love uh, congregations uh, to get in, involved. We are, as soon as the pandemic uh, lessons, we'll continue to do delegations there because it really shines a light on the root causes of migration. So uh, if you can make a donation or facilitate one from your congregation, it would be a great help. Thank you so much. And I see that Ann Schulz put something in the, in the chat. So thank you again. Jose, I'll turn it to you. A wonderful event, you know, we want to thank each of you for joining us today, for marking the 40th anniversary of our sisters. We thank you for planting the seeds to celebrate the 45th, 50th and 100th Roses in December anniversaries. We're planting seeds for our sisters to be here for a long time with us. Special gracias. Thank you to each of the members of the planning committee, Ann Schultz, Lisa Kane, Ann Pratt, Jean Stockton, Lynn Kirkonnell, myself, for your wisdom, creativity, and many meetings, including the last two meetings today in hundreds of hours of labor of law. We also want to recognize the sisters of St. Joseph of Rochester, Sister Kathy Wider, for painting the most beautiful poster for the 40th anniversary for our sisters. Gracias to the SHARE team, Isabel, Claudia, Annabel, Graciela, for working on this great anniversary. Over the last 40 years, we have taken 10,000 women and men to El Salvador and Honduras. Please help us organize the delegations this December 2021 to walk with the, in the Holy Land with the people as they rebuild from the hurricanes. We are building a virtual museum of our, on our website to remember our sisters. We invite you to send us pictures, art, testimonies, so we will collect all that information there for everybody to see it. You will receive a follow-up email with details, instructions, and the link to the museum. We again want to thank you for your ongoing love and support to communities in El Salvador, in Honduras, our immigrants here in the US to build alternatives to poverty, for helping us to rebuild after the hurricanes and help people plant the milpa to produce their own food. Now, we have time for informal sharing and Sister Ann Pratt will guide us on how to participate and share your stories. Please keep them to one to two minutes, but do share. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Jose. At the end of the um, 
video, you heard them singing about the dreamer of the dreams. And so we would like to give you a chance to um, share with us um, about how the four women are inspiring you in your own lives. In order to be able to do that, if you um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a um, icon that says participant. And if you um, click on that participant, it'll come up over on the right hand side of your screen. And at the bottom of that, it should give you a way to um, raise your hand because there's enough of us on this that it'll be difficult, I think, for us to raise our hands. So are people able to find that icon? Well, if, if you can't find the icon, just wave your hand and the different members of the team will try to notice you. Um, and unmute yourself before you try to speak, please. Are we going to see everybody who is on this the way it opened up with showing everyone who was in attendance? Uh, the best way to do that is to put your, um, uh, go to the upper right-hand corner of your in, screen. In view. Yes. And, and put it on gallery view. And then you can flip through the- Okay, that's what I was asking. Okay, you got it? Got it. Okay. And also, if anybody wants to, you could put in the chat um, who you are and where you're from. Do you want me to tell you who I am? That would be wonderful. All right. I'm Sister De Montfort, a Dominican sister of Caldwell, New Jersey. This touches my heart because I knew the family of Eda Ford. Her, uh, I hired her sister-in-law to be a French teacher in our private academy, Lacadier, Upper Montclair, New Jersey. And Mary Ann was pregnant with their last child, John. And John was born December 2nd. And Ida did not know that. She was just waiting and hoping and all like that. So this touches me so. I cannot thank the Racine Dominicans and all of you for what you have done tonight for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, sister. I, I don't know why the um, raise your hand and the participant thing does not seem to be working right now, but under reactions, there's also a way to um, raise your hand or put a, 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 a thumbs up in there. I see. Julian, are you wanting to speak? Could you please unmute yourself? Yes, please. If I could just say, uh, I'm speaking from London. It's after midnight here. Uh, just to say that the, the events that took place in London and in Rome, we were involved with as the uh, Romero Trust in London. Um, we had a, a wonderful service in London, uh, organized with the Conference of Religious, which is the same, I think, as your leadership conference in the States and uh, with uh, Pax Christi and, uh, and CAFOD. Uh, women Religious led it, and we, it was talking about the four women as represented. Oh, Julian, you're muted. Somebody's muted. Did you hear anything I said? Yes, just the yeah. very last words we missed. Uh, so the, the service was uh, in seeing the four women as the named of the nameless women martyrs the dozens and hundreds of catechists and leaders, delegates of the world that were raped and killed. And we've often, I'm afraid, glossed over the fact that they were raped and killed. 
And the, the Romero in life was the voice of the voiceless, in death is the named of the nameless. But he and Rutilio Grande and Cosme Spisotto, they're, they're all wonderful figures, but there has been no named of the nameless women. And these four, as you've seen from these beautiful pictures and wonderful uh, videos, are venerated by the people in Chalatenango by the, and by the women in particular. And that's why they need to be icons for that. Uh, for that time. So we, we focused on that uh, in, in London in a beautiful service that was online, I'm afraid, because of COVID, but we had a wonderful participation from all over Britain and from elsewhere. At the same time, we talked to the International Union of Superiors General in Rome, who were very, very keen to do something because these sisters are a model of cr across the world. And I think that's a little bit what we felt. This has got to be globalized. We're a universal church and they are universal icons. So they were keen and we talked to uh, the, there's a church in Rome, it's English speaking community Caravita and with Caravita and the Union of Superiors General a mass uh, was organized and Cardinal Michael Cherney instantly agreed to do it. Uh, he's in charge of the work with, uh, with uh, uh, migrants, uh, refugees, people fleeing violence for whom these women again are, are iconic figures today, exactly right. So he gave a beautiful sermon, a beautiful mass, and you can find that on our Romero Trust website. At the same time, we asked, is it at all possible that the Holy Father, Pope Francis, would say something? And so I just put up on the, uh, on the chat uh, what he said. He said it in Italian, but the translation is underneath, recognizing them as exemplary uh, missionary, uh, missionary disciples for the, for the whole church. And I think that's something very important. This is a uh, it universalizes what was going on so beautifully in Chalatenango, in, in San Pedro Nonualco, uh, and, and all over the United States. So congratulations. Uh, it, was, 